Um, we have actually, we're going to give 15 minutes for every uh, speaker. Then uh, we'll have to listen to both speakers first before we move to the open forum. If you really have a question, you could actually type it in the chat box and I'll read them later during the open forum. Or you can actually wait uh, later to virtually raise your hand and ask your questions directly to the speaker. Okay, to start for today's uh, morning session, let me introduce our first speaker. He is a research fellow at the Asia Pacific Pathways to Progress Foundation and a member of the board of directors of the Philippine Association for Chinese Studies. He is currently a Taiwan fellow and a visiting scholar at the National Chengdu University Department of Diplomacy and Center for Foreign Policy Studies. He was a lecturer at the Chinese Studies Program of the Ateneo de Manila University and at the International Studies Department of the De La Salle University. He was formerly a technical assistant with the National Coast Watch Council Secretariat under the Office of the President of the Republic of the Philippines. He also served as a research associate and consultant for several projects on marine time issues and Philippine foreign policy. He obtained his Master of Laws from Peking University. His commentaries and analysis on Philippine security and foreign policy and Southeast Asian affairs appear in China US Focus, Asia Times, CSIS Asia Marine Time, Transparency Initiative, South China Morning Post, and The Diplomat. Without further delay, may I call on our distinguished speaker for this morning, Lucio Pitlo III. Lucio, your turn. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Yugyuk Singh, for the uh, very generous introduction. Uh, thank you, Father Ari, uh, my uh, co-speaker, uh, Dr. Tina Clemente. Uh, thank you to all uh, who are joining today's uh, session. So allow me to share my screen. Uh, Are you able to do it, Lucio? Um, uh, it, it seems I can't, Father. Hold on. Huh? Or I, I can uh, send this, uh, Father. No, go ahead. Uh, I made you the host for okay. now, so you can share, yeah? Can, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, the topic for uh, today's uh, session, uh, this morning's session, is on uh, bilateral relations between the Philippines and China. My talk will try to uh, focus on uh, the uh, security and the political or geopolitical aspect. So, I, I titled it uh, Philippines China Relations Steadying Trouble Ties. We all know. There's, uh, uh, of course, a lot of turbulence of late uh, on bilateral ties. So I'll, I'll try to uh, give my piece on that. So to provide a short introduction, of course, the uh, relations with uh, China is very important for the Philippines on the, on two points, uh, two of many points. But uh, I think these two points stand out. So the first uh, is that China is the Philippines' largest trade partner. And uh, development agenda of the Philippines can be served well also by partnering uh, with China. So be it in terms of more market access for Philippine export goods, uh, including its tropical fruits, uh, capital investments, uh, infrastructure, whether hard or, or soft infrastructure, uh, transition to more use of renewable energy resources, upgrading in terms of the value chain like mineral processing and even in port industrial revolution like electric vehicles and so on. But at the same time, we also have to recognize that the security irritants, you know, uh, threat perception or risk assessment uh, is also an aspect of the relation. So this is something that both sides have to manage well. So the challenges for the relations, uh, of course, the maritime role is very important. It's getting a lot of uh, attention of late. And it's already, uh, in a way, affecting the momentum of bilateral uh, relations, the broader aspect of the relations. 
Uh, another challenge is policy continuity, because uh, as we all know, uh, th there have been shifts of uh, Philippine foreign policy depending on uh, you know who is uh, in power. So the leadership change, elections bring in a fresh uh, set of leadership, and uh, this also impacts on where the foreign policy or security pendulum swing of uh, the Philippines lands. So it could be uh, either tilting very close or like uh, alignment with the US or uh, friendly uh, relations uh, towards China. So we, we have seen this from the transition from the former Arroyo government to the Aquino government, and then from the Aquino administration to the previous Duterte government, and now to the Marcos administration, the second uh, Marcos uh, government. So policy continuity. So with every six years uh, change in, in the Philippine government comes uh, also uncertainty about uh, what are the priorities of the next uh, Philippine government, especially in relation to dealing with uh, the uh, increasingly complex geopolitical environment, as well as uh, handling relations with two important uh, partners, uh, US and China. And uh, this is where the point about the great power competition uh, comes in. So both US and China are important for the Philippines uh, on economics and security. And the increasing uh, animosity between these two giants is of course constraining Philippine diplomacy. Uh, again, we, we are not the uh, Philippines, it's not the only country uh, in this kind of uh, dilemma, but uh, because of the Philippines alliance with the US, uh, among uh, Southeast Asian countries. And uh, of course, the proximity of China, it's increasing trade interdependence with China. So the country is being put in a bind. So we are over a year into the Marcos Jr. administration, the new government that came in last year. So initially there was a sense of optimism. Uh, China uh, tried to set or signal a desire to keep stable relations with the uh, new Marcos uh, Jr. government, trying to build on from the previous uh, uh, Duterte administration. So three uh, officials, high officials from China, uh, came to Manila to, to pay their respects to the new government. Uh, Vice President Wang Qishan attended the inauguration of uh, President Marcos Jr. We have uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi also coming in. And uh, of course, the uh, Leo Chiang Chao, the uh, International Department uh, Director of the Communist Party of China, uh, almost in quick succession. And at the same time, both uh, President Marcos Jr. and President Xi Jinping met at the sidelines of the APEC summit uh, in last, 2020, last year in Bangkok. And so th this, uh, of course, uh, sets in motion uh, a sense of uh, optimism about relations. And then cap it off with the uh, visit, state visit, of President Marcos to Beijing early this year. He was the first foreign leader uh, hosted by, by China to start the year. And so uh, this brings a lot of uh, uh, positivity into the relations. And uh, they discussed a lot of things, apparently all business. There were like 14 uh, agreements that were uh, signed uh, during the visit. 11 of those are related to, to economics, you know, tourism, uh, infrastructure, trade, agriculture, and so on. And two of them are about uh, the handover certificates for completed projects. Uh, one in um, uh, hybrid rice farming in uh, central Luzon, and the other about the uh, uh, bridges that were just recently opened. And uh, one of them, uh, of course, has bearing on the West Philippine Sea or the South China Sea, this has to do with the communication mechanism between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of both sides. Uh, pledges were made, investment pledges were committed uh, by China to the Philippines. And uh, among the key areas that were covered were, uh, were, were among the important ones also for the, uh, for the Philippines. Uh, this includes steel, agriculture, tourism, uh, renewable energy, minerals processing. And uh, so, now that that was like a very positive, uh, you know, to 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 start the relations early on, but uh, in a short span of time, uh, things change uh, quickly. 
So the, 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 the sequence of events after the state visit of President Marcos uh, dashed this positive momentum. So there were a, a spate of uh, untoward sea incidents. And of course, uh, in response to that, uh, some others argue that uh, partially uh, in response to that, there was uh, increased uh, access of the uh, of, of U.S. military uh, towards more uh, to, to more Philippine sites, uh, including three sites uh, in northern Luzon facing Taiwan, which is another flashpoint apart from the South China Sea. And we have seen the revitalization or the restoration of Philippine-U.S. alliance activities. Uh, new bilateral defense guidelines were uh, agreed during the visit of President Marcos to Washington. There was a uh, step up military exercises between the Philippines and U.S. and uh, combined maritime activities, uh, including the Sama-Sama exercises taking place as we speak. There was uh, increasing hardening in the first island chain. So we, we have seen uh, not only have to spoke engagement, but spoke to spoke engagement. So between the Philippines uh, in Australia and, and Japan, uh, talks about reciprocal acts agreement. Maybe we can touch on that a bit later. So again, uh, this development, so what does it, uh, uh, what, what do these actions signify as, uh, as far as the Philippines is concerned? It's appreciation of the uh, fluid security environment, especially in the South China Sea. And of course, uh, how does China react? You know, how does China cease this development and how does it respond to this? So there's no question that uh, there's uh, uh, an unfortunate uh, downward spiral in the relations. And so we, I think it's, it's very important to, uh, at this point, maybe I'll share some few points, some uh, few points on how I think this uh, can be uh, reversed or at least uh, uh, averted further downward uh, spiral. So I think less talk, less mistake, uh, very important, and stick to the message. So again, the maritime issue uh, is uh, one aspect of the relations. It's one uh, among many issues that both sides have to deal with. It's not, uh, it's from the security standpoint, that it's very important to manage, to, to address the security concerns, but uh, allowing it to, again, uh, uh, contaminate the, the, the broader relations will be very regrettable. And uh, so uh, I think it's very important for both sides to stress that dialogue is uh, a better way to, to address uh, the situation. And the uh, third point is that the South China Sea is uh, a bilateral issue uh, between the Philippines and China, yes, but uh, it is not uh, completely so. Because uh, again, we, we all know that this is a multi-party dispute. And uh, so this brings us to the question of why is it choppiest between the uh, Philippines and China? And I think it's also important to avoid the fanning nationalist sentiment. This, this uh, goes for both sides in order to preserve the space for, for dialogue and diplomacy. Otherwise, it, it will be very difficult for, for both leaderships, for both governments to, to undertake more diplomacy if the situation becomes so tense and uh, domestic publics uh, in, in both countries uh, harden their views. I think it's also very important to advertise the benefit from broad, broader positive relations and uh, try to highlight uh, what more can be gained if uh, there will be more cooperation, if both sides will be able to manage their differences better. So I think communicating red lines or concerns, uh, it's uh, very important. I think there needs to be uh, some very serious, frank, candid and open conversation between both sides, intimate uh, to, to uh, convey uh, you know, the, the, the kind of concerns that elicit, uh, you know, uh, hard uh, sentiments or hard reaction for, from, from, from both sides. So I think from the Philippine uh, side, uh, I think these are so, some of the uh, key points. So uh, the, the, any occupation or building of structures in uh, Panatag Shoal or Bajo de Masunlok or internationally known as Scarborough uh, will, will, of course, not be uh, uh, received well. And the interference in Philippine fishing and oil and gas activities in the country's exclusive economic zone in the West Philippine Sea, of course, uh, I, again, I think this is also a, a serious concern on the part of the Philippines. Any attempt to disrupt uh, routine, regular resupply uh, missions to Philippine-administered features of the Kalayan Island Group, including in a Yumin Shoal, 
uh, again, uh, I think these are concerns that the Philippines would raise with their Chinese counterpart. On, on, on Beijing's end, I think uh, it's increasingly worried about the growing presence of you know, its rivals, notably the US, but also uh, other countries like uh, Japan and Australia uh, in the South China Sea and being uh, facilitated through such arrangements like joint patrols. So uh, again, the security uh, pressure being felt by the Philippines uh, is uh, in a way influencing Philippine decision to warm up more to 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 its allies and partners. So this is where the the joint patrols comes into place. But at the same time, this creates more concern on the part of China, which uh, may necessitate uh, from the part of China uh, the need to to respond accordingly. And so this kind of spiral is uh, will not be beneficial for both sides going forward. I think uh, China is also concerned about the possibility of the Philippines putting up permanent structures in a union shoal. But this is where you know you you see uh, uh, what happened in this year pre in ninety four ninety five when uh, China initially said that it was initially just for fishermen shelters the structures that they put there and by ninety eight ninety nine uh, it became more uh, more uh, there are more uh, fortifications more structures were added and obviously it's not uh just for fishing and eventually uh fast forward to between 2013 to 2016 while an arbitration case was ongoing uh, china built up those massive uh artificial islands in the south china sea including in mischief creep so creating the so-called great wall of sand at the same time so there's also i think that concern about uh you know the survivability of uh, agreements uh, entered into between the Philippines and China under, you know, one government, and then uh, the ability of, of that arrangement to uh, to be honored uh, or to be kept by the succeeding government. Uh, we have seen this, for instance, with, in the case of the joint marine seismic undertaking from the Arroyo administration. Uh, it was scuttled, you know, it was uh, uh, discontinued by the subsequent uh, Aquino second administration. And so now uh, the MOU uh, on joint oil and gas development that uh, the previous the 30 government and China uh, agreed on now is 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 uh, is under uh, is under threat uh, because of you know the recent uh, ruling of the Supreme Court and of course the attitude also of the current administration. So uh, recently uh, there was uh, an, an agreement of uh, ASEAN countries and China in relation to the COC to the effect that there would be like uh, they uh, tried to chart out a uh, three year time frame by which to conclude the COC. And I think this uh, may also inject a lot of uncertainty because uh, claimants may try to step up more activities before the deadline, you know, before the conclusion of the COC. So I think this injects also a lot of uh, uncertainty into the present mix. So uh, let me share my points on, on, on two, uh, two, two flash points. So the one in Ayungin and one in Scarborough Shoal. So. Excuse me, Lucio, sorry, because the hosting was transferred to you. If you could just admit any participants who might be waiting there. And then we'll fix it after your part. But if you see any to be admitted, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, one flash point is a union. So uh, of course, uh, there's a lot of incidents in relation to Philippine attempts to resupply, to take its troops in that feature and uh, Chinese interference with that activity. So I think there's a lot to, to lose on the part of China and almost negligible, very little to gain. So it, it reinforces this David and Goliath show. It's really bad optics for China. So of course, you compare uh, Chinese Coast Guard ship with the Philippine Coast Guard ship, and in, in fact, even with the Philippine Navy ship, the size disparity is just huge. And so for a uh, Chinese Coast Guard ship to use water cannons, uh, you know, to, to prevent uh, this resupply, especially uh, against two civilian fishing boats that are bringing the supplies to a rusting platform in, in, atop a remote isolated atoll in the South China Sea. I, again, the, the, the picture, you know, the imagery is really uh, very negative. And it's also very hard for the Philippines to understand 
that you know China have this massive artificial islands in the South China Sea, while the uh, BRP Sierra Madre, its uh, outpost in the uh, Ayungin Shoal, is uh, really very exposed to the elements and, and you know might be swallowed by the sea in no time at all. And so uh, the Philippines is trying to uh, uh, to, to upgrade, uh, uh, strengthen its uh, uh, the ship to prevent it from uh, you know to, to up make the living conditions of uh, Philippine Marines that are stationed in that uh, uh, feature uh, more, more, more habitable to, to increase the capacity, the bearing capacity of the ship. And uh, of course, in the South China Sea, uh, while of course activities of, of one claimant uh, elicits protest of another claimant, uh, there had been, uh, as far as my recollection is concerned, no case wherein a, a disputant or a claimant physically interfered in a routine resupply or attempts to rebuild structures uh, in, in a feature de facto administered uh, by that country. And so for, for China to do what it is doing in a Yungin Shoal, not only bad for optics, but uh, in a way it also violates some kind of unwritten gentleman arrangement that has been in place in the South China Sea for, for, for a long while. So let me go to the flashpoint on Panatag Shoal or Bahao de Masinlok or Scarborough Shoal. So Philippines is concerned about the Chinese presence there and uh, you know the, the fear that the near control of, of that feature by, by Chinese authorities may presage a uh, potential occupation going forward. You know, similar to what happened in the Sea Free. Initially they were present there, fishermen, uh, and then eventually they put up fishermen shelters and then uh, fast forward became a fortified structure. So I think it's very important for China to, to step back and to, to refrain from uh, impeding Philippine fishermen from fishing inside the lagoon. And uh, unless both sides agree to uh, consider the area a joint uh, fishing zone or a maritime sanctuary or a restricted fishing area, or uh, both sides, you know, uh, can uh, develop the area as a joint fishing zone and for, for both sides to regulate you know the, the fishing season and also the, the catch to make the yield sustainable uh, allow for, uh, for for the marine science people to to set the parameters for fishing activities and also uh, uh, some kind of agreement that uh, would provide assistance to fishermen of both countries uh, in times of inclement weather, so search and rescue. So I, I think the kind of cooperation that can be built on Panata Shoal can be a platform or an example, a precedent that can be used elsewhere in the South China Sea. So I, I think this is one area of cooperation, uh, low hanging that both sides can consider. So far, the, the strategy of the present administration in relation to the uh, West Philippine Sea is this uh, bear all, tell all, transparency, uh, you know, approach? Uh, these are my thoughts on 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 on, on this strategy. Uh, so one, there is no positive correlation between the noise and strong position in the South China Sea. It's not that you are noisy on the South China Sea; your position is very strong. Uh, actually, uh, in some cases, uh, it, it's uh, even the reverse. So. You, one party is very noisy on the South China Sea, uh, but uh, its position is very untenable. Uh, its uh, structures uh, in its administered features in the South China Sea uh, is uh, very weak relative to, to other players. You know, If, if you look at the uh, Philippine features uh, in the Kalayan Island group, it's the most environmental friendly compared to say Vietnam, uh, China, even Malaysia. So also, uh, of course, uh, Philippine uh, media coverage or international media uh, coverage uh, joining Philippine resupply or patrols on uh, on the South China Sea. Uh, th th this is happening, but we don't see uh, the same case uh, with, with the media or, 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 or other uh, claimant states, like in the case of Indonesia, Malaysia, which are democratic. Uh, maybe for Vietnam, you can make a case that the uh, government is trying to put a lead in the situation. Uh, so this approach of trying to publicize or to internationalize the issue 
again, we, uh, needs to answer the question of whether it is a means in itself or just an end. Is it a way to try to put pressure on China to try to you know uh, put put China on the spot to increase uh, reputational cost in China as a means to 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 bargain you know in, in any negotiation? Uh, again, there's gains and risks to this kind of approach, and of course there's talk about more lawsuits, considering more uh, legal uh, cases that may be filed against China. I think that uh, there is more substantive to be gained through negotiations than you know uh, in a court of public opinion. I think you know in 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 private cases this is uh, the the norm. I I think in 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 international setup, uh, this is also the case. Unless again, uh, the exposure is is a uh, is a strategy to to strengthen the hand in any negotiation. So the So the, the South China Sea is uh, again very important for the Philippines, but uh, again, it's uh, you, you look at the broader aspect of the relations. So other countries are also uh, they have their own uh, strategies in, in dealing with, with China or uh, in dealing with the issue of the South China Sea, and so um, how they uh, how they appreciate you know all of this moving pieces. This very fluid uh, environment, the onset of geopolitical contest, uh, where South China Sea is uh, increasingly also becoming an arena. So I I think all of this has also uh, needs to be considered by the Philippines as well. So people try to uh, compare uh, the approaches of the previous government and the current government in dealing with with the issue of the South China Sea, and and, and here. Again, uh, that, well, it may be uh, too premature to compare, uh, considering you know the uh, the previous government is already uh, they already uh, have done their time, and it's still a little too early uh, on the part of the Marcos Jr. administration. But but here we see uh, like a contrast in terms of the approach. So uh, the previous government uh, tried to at the first uh, onset uh, tried to build a sturdy container, a strong container. To try to to uh, to put on the difficult uh, aspects of the relations. So the uh, the previous the third government tried to do a soft landing when the 2016 South China Sea award came in. Uh, of course, at the same time, it did not uh, renege or it did not uh, uh, downplay uh, the need to modernize the Philippine military and the Philippine Coast Guard, uh, which are uh, on the front line in protecting, defending Philippine maritime interests. Uh, we, we have seen a former Secretary of Defense, Lorenzana, doing a symbolic flag raising in Pagasa, and Pagasa getting its biggest construction upgrade since the late 1970s. And uh, of course, the Philippines also tried to put sovereign markers, uh, sovereignty markers in its northernmost islands in Mabulis, in Batanes, and its southernmost islands in Panguan, in Tawi Tawi. So I, I think this signifies the uh, uh, desire of the uh, previous government to strengthen uh, to signal to uh, neighbors and also to the domestic public the importance of uh, national security, uh, territorial integrity, and of course jurisdiction. And uh, of course, at the same time, uh, despite uh, fostering friendly friendly relations with Beijing, uh, Duterte uh, raised the uh, South China Sea Award in two UN General Assembly sessions. And uh, of course, relations with the U.S. Uh, were, were troubled under the previous government. I think this was an opening that that, that China uh, also capitalized on. Now, the the, the current uh, Marcos Jr. administration, uh, we all know, uh, increasingly challenged bilateral ties between the Philippines and China. While uh, while on the other hand, there is almost the restoration, uh, the revitalization of uh, Philippine-U.S. alliance ties. And recently, of course, we uh, there was an incident where. Uh, U.S. Uh, aircraft flew over a Philippine resupply mission to Ayungin. So people were, were were asking whether this will be the kind of uh, arrangement going forward where U.S. will be present or involved in some form or, or uh, in some form to to support uh, Philippine activities in its uh, exclusive economic zone. And whether uh, the Philippines will try to lean more 
uh, with the U.S. in order to fund uh, support Philippine uh, military modernization, Coast Guard modernization, um, and whether the EDCA is uh, like providing access in return for U.S. bankrolling or or, or funding uh, a, a great deal of Philippine uh, military modernization, and. Whether, of course, this uh, signal uh, resolve on the part of the Philippines that uh, it will seek more partnerships, uh, it will strengthen its alliances with uh, so-called like-minded uh, allies and partners as it feels more insecure uh, as China's pressure on the West Philippine Sea increases. So I think I will end there and uh, I'd, I'd leave more, more time for Juni. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Pitlo, for that thought-provoking and enlightening talk for this morning. Indeed, um, we should avoid um so much of the nationalist sentiment so that real dialogue can be made. So, audience, before you post in your questions, okay, we'll move on first to our next speaker. So, you could actually type your, your question. I'll read them later. So, moving on to our next speaker, let me read. Okay, our next speaker is a professor at the Asian State. Asian Center, University of the Philippines, Diliman. She earned her economics degree from the School of Economics, UP. Her research interests include development studies, China studies, Philippine-China economic relations, and economic history. Dr. Clemente is a former president of the Philippine Association for Chinese Studies and a former director, editor-in-chief of the Chinese Studies Journal. She's a Gawad Chancellor Awardee for the 2022 Natatanging Guru. Without further ado, let me call on Dr. Tina Clemente. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, wait, let me just uh, set my timer. <laughs> I think we're given just 15 minutes now. Okay, so I'll try to keep within the time. Okay, so um, thank you again for having me here. I'm so glad to be with you this morning. Um, allow me to share my screen. All right. Um, can everybody see it? Okay. So let me start. Um, uh, earlier, we heard uh, Lucia's talk on the security, uh, the political and security aspects. And so, in my part, I will in my in my presentation, I'll be talking about a strong and resilient Philippines and Philippines-China economic relations. Okay, so basically, uh, what I'd like to do this morning is to um, reflect on the notion of having a strong domestic economic policy that redounds to bilateral relations. No, okay. So my presentation has four parts. The first is patterns of engagement, followed by preconditions of partnership. And in those two sections, I will be focusing on exports and uh, we'll try to extrapolate uh, reflections no, on other things. But because of the limited time, that's the only one. That's the only uh, uh, part that I can fit. No? OK, and then um, I also talked about uh, the RCEP or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It's just a brief note. No? And then I will close with a few remarks. Okay, let's get to it. So patterns of engagement. Um, okay, you, uh, before you, you see a bar chart, right? And I apologize if the text is too small for you, but but it's okay. I'll just tell you what, what you see. So um, the biggest bar pertains to uh, the exports of ASEAN, uh, the total exports of ASEAN to the world. And then um, you have Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and you're wondering when I will say the Philippines, right? The Philippines, Cambodia, Myanmar, Brunei, and Laos. Okay, so so um, these bars just uh, show you um, exported value you know, from all these economies, as as well as uh, the total exports from ASEAN. And looking at this picture, I don't know with you, but I'm not so happy about where the Philippines is. No? Uh, especially that uh, Vietnam has powered ahead and is already second to Singapore. No, and um. I, I, I'm quite displeased about this because this didn't happen overnight. Now, it takes a while no, before you before you go to the top ranks. And so um, the observation is, since Vietnam is already second to Singapore, uh, they've been investing in the things that should be invested in for a long period of time because 
getting to that rank cannot happen in 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 just a few years. No, it's a sustained thing. But you're probably also wondering that um, exports cannot only be uh, the indicator of development, and that's true, right? You see an outlier there, which is Brunei. Brunei is second to the last. But Brunei is an exception because um, it doesn't really need to export much to maintain their level of development because they do have uh, they do have oil, right? But basically, uh, if you compare the Philippines with its regional peers, exports uh, would be um, a very good indicator uh, because so many things are attached to exports, so many domestic policies, and. Uh, we will talk about that later. But for reference, you're probably wondering what, what's the level of Philippine exports. And I provided a reference for you on the right. Uh, you have the total um, Philippine exports to the world would be uh, nearly 79 billion. So 70, 79 billion is not so not so much if you contextualize it uh, among our regional, our regional peers, among our cohort countries. Okay, and then I provided also um, uh, the figures for the top markets. Now you have U.S., Japan, China, Hong Kong. But if you combine China and Hong Kong, that puts China in, first, uh, in the first place, right? So you have a total of 21.5 billion. Okay, so let's move on. Um, here you find a tree map. No? But there are better tree maps that you can generate uh, online if you want, but I don't care for them so much because um, I prefer adhering to the HS codes, not the, harmoni the harmonized system codes uh, in, in trade figures, so that when you go back to the raw data, it's easier to um, to find how they correspond. No? So it's a little bit wordy, but uh, I hope you can bear with it. So here on this tree map, you see that um, electrical machinery and equipment and uh, the stuff related to that take nearly 50% of our um, of our exports to China okay so you might be wondering um, how did I how did I select these so what they did was I looked at the raw data and um, chose all the exports to China that have at the very least a one percent share so everything above that would be included so um, I ended up with 10. 10 product categories. You have electrical machinery, that's nearly half. And then you have ore, slag, and ash, uh, that's about 12%. And then copper, you have about 9%. And then nuclear reactors, boilers, etc., about 6.5%. Edible fruit and nuts would uh, uh, constitute about nearly 5%. And within that, you have the banana, so that's even a, a, a lower share, right? And all the other things take up an even lower share. So, so basically, um, you could see the pattern, right? Um, we are sending at most or at best uh, light manufacturers, selling light manufacturers to China, and the rest would be um, uh, unprocessed resources or, or raw materials, okay? So that's the pattern. And the pattern is not so different um, from the ASEAN pattern, except that... Um, of course, understandably, because we're looking at um, all the ASEAN economies, there would be more pat product categories. But you would see that electrical machinery and equipment and parts, etc., um, constitute uh, thirty-five about thirty-five percent, right, of the trade in China, and then the rest would be as you see on the screen. So, um, uh, Philippines, China, you have about ten. Um, you could say major categories, and within those ten. Um, there are uh, machinery, electrical machinery, taking up most of it, right? And um, here, I forgot to say, here in the Philippine, in the Philippine case, uh, these ten categories constitute about ninety-two percent already, right? So you 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 get the sense that um, in terms of diversification, it's pretty low, right? In terms of spread, okay. So the pattern is quite similar, you know, but it's just that there are more categories considered. But um, in terms of the in terms of the um, how it's skewed towards um, relatively low value added goods, uh, that's the what that's the picture that we see. Okay, I'd like to do some devil's advocate here, some devil's advocate analysis here, right? So I'm going to show you two um, pictures of product spaces. Okay. 
So in this picture, you see the product space of the Philippines and China. So let me just explain a few things, right? So you see colors, right? Blue um, and yellow. Those are the, 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 the two extremes. No? So the more blue dots you have, that means the more products or goods um, the Philippines has uh, with comparative advantage over China, right? So basically what we want is, is to see more blues than yellows. Okay, but this isn't the case, and we kind of expect that because China is the um, is top one in terms of trade and in, in terms of exports in the world. No, but um, I'm showing this to you so we can compare it to Vietnam. No, it's it's very useful to compare uh, the state of things here with uh, um, with another economy within ASEAN or ASEAN itself. No, because it allows us to. To reflect a little bit more about how the picture really is. It, sometimes when you look at values in a vacuum, they don't mean anything. Okay, so so here. So um, I will be going back and forth between the two images. But this is, this. try to imprint this in your mind so that when we go to the next picture, you see. Okay, so this is Vietnam's picture. Now you could say that it's not too different, right? It's not too different. Um, perhaps Vietnam has a little bit more blue dots, but basically it's not too far if you're just fo focusing on this picture. Now, let me go back to the Philippines again. Okay, now, no, but the thing is, um, because you, you already saw the first few slides, right? The first few charts, and you could now, you could now um, glean the insight that there are many factors, right? There are many factors that lead us to um, a better pattern, a, a better pattern in terms of uh, uh, quality no? in trade, right? So we saw that in terms of volume, um, in terms of exported value, our, our, our level is really low, right? But here, what do we see here? In terms of uh, um, products or goods, where we have comparative advantage, it's not so bad. Right? So how do we reconcile? No, because the thing is, even if you have um, a larger spread of products that you're selling, right? it may not mean so much when most of those products uh, are not so major no? for the country um, that's actually buying. No, you follow. So if you remember the tree map, right? you saw the tree map. Okay, so those are just 10 categories, but those 10 already constitute 92% of what we sell no, to China. But within those 10, you have one category that is so dominant. So that's what we're saying. Even if you have a big spread right, of, of products where you have comparative advantage over China, um, uh, maybe a simple way of saying it is that uh, if those products are not too important, to China, then it doesn't matter if you have a big spread no? because there are other things. Now, I provided a reference for you on the right side, upper right side. ECI stands for Economic Complexity Index. So um, there's so many factors, right? But I'll just limit it uh, to trade, tech, and research. But um, also, uh, when you look at the data, these are the three things that you're also measuring. No? So economic complexity in terms of trade, the Philippines is number 37. Vietnam is lower much lower, number 58, okay? Um, going back, in terms of technology, here's the, here's, the, here's the difference. The Philippines is ranked 61 out of 95 countries ranked. But Vietnam is it's much higher, 47. Now, in terms of research, the Philippines is ranked 80, and Vietnam is just uh, one rank away, 81. So, um, it, it, it tells you that even if um, we're sort of the same in terms of uh, product spread, right? Or products where we have uh, comparative advantage over China, Vietnam is uh, doing much better no? in terms of technology and not so far in research and other things that are not captured in this map, like ease of doing business. Now, so all those things um, work together and determine... Um, the pattern no, of, of trade. Okay, I'll show you these last two maps. You're probably getting overloaded already with maps. No? But uh, this is very interesting. So these show uh, uh, these two maps will show you how we're faring in terms of market diversification. So look at this map. Okay, so you're wondering what's yellow, what's blue. So basically, the Philippines export growth uh, to 
to to to to whatever we're selling with, no, um, would be less than uh, import growth from the world. Okay, so the blue the blue dots mean the blue circles mean Philippines export growth to partner um, would be greater than partner import import growth from the world. So basically, what you want is to see more blues than yellows. Okay, more blues than yellows because again, if you have if you have more blues then that means that your share in your um in your partners um imports would be more than than the growth of their imports right so it's it's going to be a bad signal if you have more yellows but this is the predicament now at least in 2022 by the end of 2022 this is how it looks like right and you also see the share so for the philippines you have um china the us and japan and Hong Kong, like what I showed you earlier. But let's look at Vietnam case. Vietnam has more blues, and um, obviously a bigger share uh, from the U.S. and China, right? So to, uh, the U.S. and China are buying more, so to speak. So the volume is much higher, the exported value is so much higher. But if you look at also the other markets uh, that are that you know where Vietnam exports end uh, end up in, you'd see the the indications of of more blue circles. So so that tells us right. It, it I hope it makes us reflect on um, certain things that we need to do because I'm showing you these pictures. I, I'm showing you these charts, not these figures, because we need to work backwards. I think after a long period of time of trying, you know, not, not just trying to sell in general, but trying to extract um, economic benefits from China or other countries. Um, I'm concerned about the fact that we're not panicking anymore. I'm concerned about the fact that we're not worried um, anymore about long-standing bottlenecks, long, long-standing impediments. No, So the, the, the thing is, what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't just gun for raising the level of trade. But more importantly, we have to think about also raising the quality of trade. And why do I say that? Because um, we always find new support saying, now, okay, there's potential here. That's good. Let's increase this. That's fine. These are our targets and then these. But the issue will always go back to gross value added, right? If we are stuck, regardless of the export volume increasing, no? if we are stuck, in low value added products or exports, then um, that compromises how we generate GV, uh, GV, GVA. And in turn, that compromises our position in global value chains. Right. So for me, it's not it's not anymore enough to to target a level or or to be gratified when we see increases in trends. Right? The thing is, is there transformation within? Because that is Okay, that's my timer. <laughs> okay, but the thing is, there is there there needs to be transformation within. So any every time we cultivate a partnership, that should actually be uh, the back of our minds, right? So okay, let's ask the question: What constrains GVA generation, right? So first, facilitating the transition out of low GVA exports, i.e., our raw materials or light manufacturers. No, to China will require interventions to improve the competitive advantage in tech incentive sectors, infra logistics networks, and skilled human resource. So some of these things Lucio already mentioned earlier, like key sectors where we can partner in, right? But I think the, the key point here is not just to say, okay, um, these are, are sectors where uh, China can come in. But there's the strategic element there, right? Um, from our side, because it's it's us, no, it's the Philippine side, um, that should be implementing its own strategic plan, right? So that's the thing. No? And then the second thing is also capacity building and tackling Chinese market standards, um, IPR, and trade regulations. Because it's not just about, okay, let's get into a partnership. And then we find out that on paper, it's nice, right? It feeds optimism. But the actuality of it is much harder because Excuse me, because there's so many rules and regulations that are disparate. Okay. And also sustainability must be part of the plan because uh, if you're not thinking about that then sooner or later, it might lead to trade barriers and hampered market access. What other things? These challenges also demonstrate um, that, strategic, uh, sorry, that strategic development policy should be attentive to domestic bottlenecks and the preconditions of advancing such partnerships. 
Meaning, you don't go into partnerships from the cold. Because even getting into partnerships require preparation, right? If you're not ready, then um, be prepared to be disappointed. I think that's the that's what we've seen in so many, all right, in so many things like like the BRI, for example. So this applies not only to Philippines China trade, you know, but also things like the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, so but what about diversification to build resilience? Um, diversification is something. It's difficult. It's difficult to discuss because it's necessarily tied to structural reforms, right? You cannot just say, "Okay, let's 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 sell to another market today." It doesn't happen that way because it goes along with structural reforms. Now, if we are not if we are not attentive, or if we are not uh, if we just want more more values increasing exported value, for example, you no, know, but we are not attentive to transformation within, then again, be prepared to dis to to be disappointed. Okay, now um, I just have a few slides already, uh, just just to show you. So I, I told you that I will say a, a short um, note about RCEP. So we, we we know that RCEP serves ASEAN's and China's objectives in many ways. However, several issues in ASEAN countries affect the level of success no, of 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 the agreement. And what are these? Unequal development among ASEAN members, for example, right? And the Philippines. I'm I'm. I am I am not so optimistic because of our because of the Philippines' track record when it comes to agreements. No, there is some gain, no, but uh, because again uh, of the domestic impediments, um, we're only able to extract um, low values. No, so there's also uneven industrial development, varied skilled human resource complement when it comes to the sectors of technology and then services. There's also a disconnect between actual outcomes and projected gains, which lead to domestic public dissatisfaction that, that unfortunately affects the narrative of relations. So what I'm trying to say is that if we want to improve the narrative of relations, right, um, it, it cannot just be all PR, right? There needs to be substantive transformation domestically. Uh, for it to for it to happen, so RCEP seeks to standardize standardize norms and regulations, but again, disconnects and national policies can be an obstacle, and not just be a small. It, it can be a major obstacle, all right. And the SMEs are the are the ones that are most affected in this. Okay, so I also included environmental sustainability, uh, needing more attention in the RCEP's framework because. Um, eventually, what we want to happen is to move away from extractive, no, from extractive development. Okay, so I'll, I'll um, so in the Philippines, um, we keep looping back to the same issues, right? Um, why is it going to be challenging for the Philippines to extract benefits from RCEP? First, we go back to GVA again, limited industrial development and low GVA goods. These in turn constrain GVC participation. So it doesn't matter if we're part of a global value chain. The question is, where are we in that chain, right? Where are we in that chain? Second, it's unequal distribution of trade gains, right, within the country. And this can worsen income inequality. And last is that there is a seeming reliance on external competitive pressure to compel domestic industries to reform in lieu of us cleaning house and fixing ourselves, no? Unemployment and deindustrialization have been attributed to the wanton imposition of free trade, free trade. So how then should we proceed? We need more studies and reflection on Philippine and ASEAN economic relations with China. And then the second, it is imperative uh, that we build the necessary preconditions to shape partnerships toward better quality trade patterns. So it's not so much anymore, let's have more. Let's have more trade. Let's have more investments. Those are important. Don't get me wrong. Those are important. But then... What are we shaping, right? What pattern do we want to shape? And then while individual economies carry the burden of their own strategic development, this becomes a concern for China as well, as partnership with China will have limitations if domestic bottlenecks remain unaddressed. So it's like, you know, looking to the heavens and asking for lots of rain, right? Because we want all that water. But but the only thing, the only receptacle, right, we're using is a, is a 100 ml bottle. Right, it's necessarily constrained regardless of the potential. So, um, so I'll end there. Uh, apologies, I tried to keep time, but I still went over a little bit. Thank you very much.
answer. Okay. Thank you, Mom uh, Tina, for that. Uh, actually, thank you for the graphs, actually, that you have shown us. Actually, it it actually helps enlighten uh, the audience uh, actual, as to the current situation of the Philippine economics and how actually it fared uh, among ASEAN nations like Vietnam. And hopefully, this will actually help enlighten also the business people in the audience as to what really needs to be pursued in dealing business with China. Just like what Mam Tina said, there's a need to rethink the kind of product we export to China so it's more competitive. So at this point, uh, actually, we could actually move forward um, to our open sessions, uh, open forum. By the way, sorry for the technical glitches a while ago. Okay, so we'll improve better next time. And okay, so if there's any questions from the audience, you could actually virtually raise your hand. And I did receive already around five questions here. So maybe um, I could give the opportunity first to anyone who likes to ask a question to either of our speaker. Um. Okay, is there anyone among the audience? Um, okay, so while I actually still wait for some virtual raising of hands, okay, maybe this first question, actually, I think this is addressed to Sir Lucio. The question is, how can you comment on China's changing of the nine dash line and how should the Philippines look at it? Okay, um, Sir Lucio, are you with us? Uh, yeah. I think whether it's 9 or 10 or 11 or 12, as long as they will include the uh, Philippine features or waters, I think uh, any country uh, that would be in that situation where uh, spaces that are part of your territory or sovereign rights or part of your jurisdiction are uh, being appropriated through cartography by a neighbor uh, will elicit you know, a diplomatic protest at the least. So I, I think that should be uh, the, the reaction of the Philippines to raise this concern uh, with China. Um, thank you. Uh, for the one who actually asked the question, if you have a follow-up, you could actually reach it virtually or you could type it again and I'll read your question. Um, there's another question. I think this is more of, uh, okay, I think also for Sir Pete Law. What are the implications of the current state of the Philippine-China relation, especially with territorial issues to China's trade and investment in Visayas, especially Cebu? I think this also goes for Mam Tina. So may I call on both speakers to comment on the question? Maybe what... ma, I, I will defer to Mam Tina. <laughs> okay. What yeah, are the implications? Um, yeah. yeah. What, what are the implications in trade and Visayas and Cebu? Yeah, in Is territorial that... issues to China. Uh, wait, yeah. let me read again. What are the implications of the current state of Philippine-China relation, especially territorial issues to China's trade and investment in the Visayas, especially Cebu? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we need more studies on that um, because that's more that's quite particular, right? Uh, and I'm just looking at national figures, but just the same. Um, I understand the I understand the concern, no? Because whenever there are tensions, the first thing that a lot of, especially those in business, no, a lot of um people ask would be how would this affect trade? Because we saw it in twenty twelve, you know, tensions um uh redounded to certain predicaments, right? <laughs> especially in uh, the fruit sector. So well, we can't say no. We 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 can't say. Um, but what we need to really look at, uh, what what we really need to to also consider would be we need to lessen the reasons, no, the reasons for um such things as embargoes, such things because um one reason uh, that can be invoked would be let's say SPS issues. SPS standing for uh, sanitary and phytosanitary issues. Diba? Kasi regardless of the conflict with China, there have been issues raised about SPS no, when it comes to fruits and, and, and whatnot. No? So even under, uh, other countries have raised that. So, But especially when there are tensions, these can be magnified. No? So it's also, it, it, it's consistent with what I've been saying earlier. Um, we need to clean house. No? But but on another, on another note, um, 
this is why I'm, I'm I, I advocate also diversification. But diversification cannot be cannot happen overnight. No, like we say, okay, we have tension today, and then tomorrow we'll find a different seller. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. So supply chains um take time to develop, right? And I wouldn't want to advocate uh simply diversifying for diversify for diversification sake, right? So I um what I'm trying to say is that thinking about Philippine resilience is not so much uh just because we have a conflict. No, I, I'm think what what I'm trying to say is that uh, resilience is always good regardless, right? Because there are so many shocks, no, that we cannot and and we can't anticipate everything. A shock in the supply chain could be in the form of a pandemic effect, and we've seen that. A shock in the supply chain could be in a form of a war uh, elsewhere in the world, right? Because we're all connected. So so diversification is always something that 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 should be in mind, especially. But 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 I I get that it comes up. No, whenever there is a conflict, no. So, um, implic uh, it, it, maybe the short answer to your question, because I've been giving long answers <laughs> requiring long term analysis, right? Maybe the short question is: you you have to look at the shares first, no? You, um, meaning what particular goods na uh, could be susceptible. So, so if you're thinking about Mindanao, then the top of mind would immediately be fruits. Right? You have bananas and other things. But in the Visayas, you have to look at the profile as well and look at the shares. No? And, and, and to see what 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 possible things. No? What what others did, um, what uh, what other firms or other affected businesses did last time was to sort of transship, you know. So um let's say there's a fall in a certain product. Um they found ways to sort of um look at uh, in the short term sense, no, to look at other supply chains. Where that product could be used, uh, uh, could be could be used as raw materials or literally transshipped, no, use other countries so that it gets to uh, the market that you're trying to sell, no, which is China. Okay, so I'll give it. I'll I'll give the floor to Lucio. Sure, Lucio. Do you want to add anything to that? Ah, okay. Uh, No, no, no. Uh, I, I don't have anything to add. Uh, okay. I just saw the hand of uh, Mr. Napoleon. Ah, okay, Sir Napoleon, it, uh, you could unmute. Well, talking about uh, Chinese materials in the Philippines, I'm in the construction business, uh, hardware, and general merchandise. I would say that the product we carry in our store right now, probably 60 or 70 percent of it in China. And beside that, I have also observed that there are lots of Chinamen now present in the market, going trading, also construction. A lot of them are contractors who are quoting very low price. I try to check how low they can go. Then I found out that the raw materials they are bringing in from China are even cheaper than my cost. Mm -hmm. So it's been a good contact from China to get the cheap raw materials, and that is the reason why a lot of the China men are now being controlling the simple warehouses or simple buildings. Maybe the elaborate high-rise building, they are not yet very active, but for ordinary warehouses and ordinary one, two, three-story building, they are very competitive. Well, I feel that most of them that I have get in touch with are really businessmen. Unlike what my father shared with me before the war, there was a lot of Japanese planting abaca in our home province, Misamis Oriental. When the war broke out, my dad said all those Japanese were gone. So it means that those Japanese probably were part of the military staff because when the war broke out, they immediately were gone and probably mingled around with the. I hope that things mm. will not. In the past, no. Well, I've been mm. getting it that, and I found out that many of these businessmen are also active in what we call as the hometown association, uh, same family name association. They are very active. So that's a thing that I can share is that uh, the Chinese materials in our uh, stores, no, no, the 
goods that were carried in our store. Branded goods, Stanley, Yale, whatever it is, supposed to be American brand, are made in China. So those are the information I can share. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Sir Napoleon. I think I will add first that, then maybe our speaker could. Because there's a question here directed to me, how can businessmen on the ground actualize the suggestions, Mom Tina, you made? Considering a competitive made in China products in the Philippines, uh, I think Montina. Yeah, um, but I learned a lot also, no, from what uh Sir Napoleon mentioned, and I'll try to. Is it? Is it? Is the? It's here. I will. I didn't see the question on the chat, so it's directed okay. to. Right, right, right. So, so, so that's why I'll start first with some insights that I got from listening to Sir Nap. So this is why the intervention should be long term, it, at at the at the least medium to medium term, but it's really long term, right? That's why I had to show you the Vietnam example. It didn't happen overnight, right? Uh, to get to that level. So if you want uh, really to build resilience, um, you know we 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 build it over a course of 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 time. Right and sustain policy. So earlier, so the question is, how do we actualize? Right. So I mentioned it earlier on the slide. Right. The preconditions for partnership. So what do we need to do? So we need to sort of start panicking once we um once we grasp right the kind of patterns that we have because we cannot we cannot move forward if we don't understand what our patterns are. Right. We need to start where we are. So where we are right now is that uh, we are focusing too much on low gross value added exports. And how long do we want to stay there? Right? And um, don't get me wrong. No, I'm not saying that exporting fruits or agriculture, it's a bad thing. It's just that um, there, there's something that we call, you know, e e evolution or transformation over a period of time, you know? So even if we even if we, we 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 have a fruit sector, it doesn't mean that we want to forever, no, be be emphasizing um uh raw because the fruit sector can even move up in the value chain. No? So so that's what I'm saying. It 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 does take time. And this is not a very popular discussion. Why? Because we want answers now, right? We want answers now. I mean why should we think about 20 years from now? But but imagine if, if we were having this conversation 30 years prior to today, there might have been results already. No? So the thing is, um, if your sectors are not so integrated, that is a minus when it comes to when, when tensions come, because that will be uh, susceptible, right? So the more the more you get stuck in low value added experts or products then you are cultivating your, your, your susceptibility, right? So, you need, so that's one thing. Now, the less integrated, then that means the more susceptible, okay? Number two, um, low GVA. If it's low value added, then that means your position in the global value chain would also be low. You're easy to kick out. <laughs> You're easy to replace. So that's, what, that, that's an insight that, that, that I also got from, here, from uh, hearing Sir Nap, di ba? You know, the, the level of competitiveness, you're easy to read it. I mean, if you're if something's cheaper than, than yours, no. So the competitiveness there, no. But but if we if we look back to that question, so how do we do it? So it goes back to the basic question. So how do how do we make our sectors better? Right? <laughs> so so that doesn't that 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 won't happen next week. Right? So we need to go back to um uh transformative transformative action points no where are we investing is the electricity pa lang hindi na <laughs> medyo mataas na ang cost of doing business diyan diba those things eh no what else uh infra no and and it's not to say that nobody has the, those ideas all these ideas are out there already diba ini enumerate we just enumerate them let's go to tech let's go to infra let's go but I don't see, I'm sorry to say, but while those items are already put out there, there's so many plans, but I don't see an actual strategic plan as to the how. We just we just have lists. These are our targets. Huh? You go to the Philippine Development Plan, it's like that. There are targets. But what do we do with the bottlenecks if the bottlenecks are long-standing? No, there's no there's no conversation on that. 
Diba? We just think that, you know, it, it's all out there, but where's the where's the implementation? How do we do it? Dishnan, that's why the, the strategic thinking needs to come in. Because it will not happen just because we wish it to happen. No, so so that's 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 what I'm I'm trying to say. So even if we're so optimistic about all these deals, I'm a little scared because we've seen it already in the last presidential term, right? There's like okay, we we thought that all these things will happen and then this happened. Yeah, so I'll end there. Uh, thank you, Ma'am uh, Tina. Uh, yes, Sir Dusho, you want to add something? Oh. Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll add on the point about the political stability or. Policy continuity is very important. Again, uh, the new darling of, of foreign capital, uh, Vietnam. You know, uh, a lot of uh, stability provided because the way it formed its government. And I'm not saying that uh, we should be, uh, we should ch try to change our form of government or our political system. But uh, there is a lot to be said about, you know, the kind of long-term planning that comes with that kind of uh, government setup. And uh, of course, that is a major factor, you know, predictability that business wants, you know, investors want, and, and they see it in Vietnam. So I, I, I think you know, uh, Vietnam is already moving into the fourth industrial revolution. They already have uh, produced their own electric vehicle, you know, VinFast. And this is already exported in the US, in Europe, although it's uh, still assembled, uh, much of the components are in Vietnam. I mean, uh, from abroad and then assembled in Vietnam, but but uh, we we see a clear uh, trajectory of the government to eventually develop its own international industries and not rely on uh, becoming exporter of uh, low value goods, as uh, Dr. Clemente mentioned. And you know, Vietnam is a very interesting case because it's moving in that direction, but at the same time, where does the Philippines source ninety percent of its rice? Yes, you got it right, Vietnam. So. This is, you know, um, again, you know, um, trying to uh, be competitive on both ends, you know, agriculture, uh, industry, while trying to improve investments on, on technology and, you know, relations with important countries, you know, U.S. and China is very crucial because these are the two countries where you can get, you know, the raw materials and where you can sell eventually your goods. So having good, stable relations with both U.S. and China is important for Vietnam as it is important for others. Uh, presently, the Philippines is competing with its neighbors in ASEAN in trying to corner more investments, including from China. And, you know, uh, geopolitical issues, you know, disputes, again, it goes in the way. And, uh, you know, the, the way our other neighbors are, are, are trying to play this, you know, uh, again, as I said, you know, the South China Sea dispute is not just a bilateral thing between us, uh, between Manila and Beijing. It's a multi-party dispute. But how do other countries look at it and treat it in relation to their broader ties with China? It's very different. Malaysia, very quiet diplomacy. You know, one of the biggest infrastructure projects of China in the region, the East Coast railing, you know, um, successive governments come and go, but the project is still there, still continuing. Uh, I think the timeline is about 2027. Uh, it might be completed. So one year before Marcos Jr. Uh, steps down from office. Recently, you know, the Jakarta Bandung High Speed Railway just opened. This is the first high speed Southeast uh, high speed uh, train in, in bullet train in Southeast Asia. And uh, again, uh, Indonesia is also uh, very much a, a, a player in the South China Sea. But this did not impede, you know, these kinds of big ticket projects. So it's very important to have uh, a lot of political stability, a lot of continuity, because uh, some projects takes time to, to build, you know, uh, infrastructure or long gestation projects. Uh, in the Philippines, no administration completes a single project in a six year time frame. So uh, it needs, you know, we, we need to have to, to convince investors that uh, politics will not be a, a big risk factor uh, in your investment or in your capital, uh, we need to uh, to to provide you know this this kind of impression you know that uh, uh, we we are a very stable uh, investor uh, investment uh, environment and that we will provide necessary guarantees and that politics will not come in the way. 
So whether it's US, whether it's China or other countries, uh, we, we need to play the same uh, tune. So it, it's very important because, you know, uh, our other neighbors are, are catching up, you know, uh, Cambodia, uh, even Laos, you know, now is a, a major exporter of energy to its neighbors. Uh, it's directly linked now with, with China to the recently built uh, China-Laos railway. So, you know, there might be discussions about, you know, whether the Belt and Road delivered for the Philippines. But, you know, when we look at how this infrastructure undertaking is changing the landscape in our neighborhood, Vietnam, its first metro line in Hanoi, uh, opened up in 2021. As I said, China Laos Railway also opened in 2021. This year, uh, to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road, we have Jakarta Bandung high speed train opening up. And, you know, in 2027, East Coast Rail Link, you know, connecting the western part and the eastern part of peninsular Malaysia will open. And so, you know, we, and, and then you know, the Philippines, what we are discussing with China projects. Uh, Bridges, you know, the, the two completed bridges, and then we are talking about three priority bridges in uh, Mangahan or Pasig. But, you know, he, no talk of uh, railways. Th there was a previous discussion on, on, on railway projects, you know, uh, on the previous uh, Duterte government, three railways, but we, we don't know now what's the attitude of the present government. So again, this infrastructure connectivity aspect is very important because, you know, it, it eases up logistical bottlenecks, you know, if you want to uh, have more absorptive capacity to attract more uh, business, you need to invest, build your infrastructure. So to the extent that other countries' initiatives jive with your connectivity roadmap, by all means, you know, try to manage uh, differences so that uh, broader relations will not be affected. Uh, thank you, Sir Pitlo, for a very informative uh, addition to what's really currently happening, especially with also the BRI and other Asian uh, ASEAN nations. Okay, so and the key thing we're hearing actually from Sir Mamtina is planning, planning, but in long term. So there is no instant answer to the questions. Okay, that was given, and uh, we have to observe pattern structure for the future growth in economy and also in politically. So we actually have a question here that's uh, from Mam. Maria Layog. Uh, the question is, amid the fluid and turbulent South China Sea scenario, how can economic convergence be expanded and common aspirations be nurtured? So, um, Mamtina? Yeah. Um, okay, so economic convergence can be many things, right? It could be uh, economic conver economic convergence in the region or did she mean just China or but I'll, I'll I'll try to to look at different aspects so um when countries when when economies or even economies within the region when they are highly integrated right there are a lot uh, uh, quite a number of benefits to that you no know? because we're we're so linked you no know? it's very difficult to um, to let tensions um, interfere with that link because everybody in the link will be affected. So that's the thing. That's why when it comes to embargoing fruits, it, it's easy, relatively easy to do because fruits are, are not so much part of a value chain diba? in that sense. No? So so that that's why I've been saying GVC, global value chains, no. And the only the the only way uh, at the risk of sounding repetitive, the only way of really maximizing that is if we go higher, no, in the value chain. But on the other hand, um, because we've seen shocks in the world, no, as of late, including the pandemic, we saw that um, convergence can also can also result in something untoward. No, uh, because if a shock happens and everybody in the league will be affected, no? that's why there's already a a perspective that while you're thinking of clustering, you know, to 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 produce more efficient um supply chains, more efficient production no, within the region, there's also that thing that as an economy you should also not put all your eggs in one basket. This is regardless of conflict. Huh? This is we think about this regardless of what we have. But, but uh, so if you want to think of common aspirations, then that's not let, let's not go far. We already have the RCEP, which is newly uh, the the newest instrument, right? 
So the question is, we're already part of that. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to litigate that. Oh, we shouldn't be. It's, it's we're already part of that. So, so the, the the question is, how then should we, should we reach a scenario where you know, um, the distribution of gains can be evened out? It's impossible to have one hundred percent evening out, right? But um, at least we can mitigate the disparities. And mitigating the disparities will, I'm sorry to say, will go back to um, uh, the domestic scene again, right? Um, because uh, not all countries have the same levers when it comes to getting into partnerships right away. I think this is a point that uh, I don't mind um, repeating all the time because we miss that. No? That's why in my conclusion, I mentioned that um, at least in the Philippine sense, we rely on external agreements to do what? To discipline ourselves domestically, right? We say that, oh, we signed it already. We can't do anything. So let's just, no. But it, it, it needs to be us um, trying to clean house no? rather than expecting an external agreement to make us efficient. Uh, we've, we've seen that so many times. No? Even the first time that we, that we joined GATT, it's a long time ago because it's already, you know, got WTO. It, things evolved already. No, so 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 I think it's that no. Um, convergence is is something to think about, uh, but also alongside how we can diversify markets. Now we don't have to converge in every little thing. No, but there are major things that we can converge in, like like trade, and the RCEP is um is an example of that. No, but mind you, RCEP is also not the first. It's also not the first agreement that we had. Uh, and if you want to be critical about where we are in the grand scheme of things, we only have to see that the Philippines has lagged behind in gains from free trade in the previous agreements. Now, that's why I'm always, um, I, I want to be optimistic, but still critical, like critical optimism, and critical engagement, right? Because, um, again, we might, setting, we might be setting up ourselves for disappointment. So it's always... How do we, it's like this, I always give this analogy to my students, right? You have a tree with so many fruits. The only way to get to the fruit is to use a ladder. So in the Philippine case, we don't want, there's no ladder, right? We're just like, okay, so will the, when will the fruit come? You know, so that's the thing, right? The ladder represents all the things that we need to do. It's a mix of things, right? Regulatory muscle. I mean, are we doing the things that we need to do? Uh, policy ease of doing business, the environment, so, so many things. No? That's why we don't we don't rank high in ease of doing business. Because it's 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 a it's a host of things, right? Paperwork, you know, paying taxes, everything. Now so many things. So so um um that's that's that 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 remains a concern. No? So uh, and also uh, the, the the type of exports, right? I'm I'm just really that's gonna be uh, something that I will really advocate, you now sooner or later. Uh, like like for example, let's just talk about minerals because Lucia mentioned that on his slide, right? So much potential. You now there's even a measure of of um untapped you no know, potential. It goes by the trillions of US dollars. It's that, no, it's untapped. No, but the thing is, okay, so so you ask, okay, so we have these political tensions and all that. Um, maybe a knee-jerk reaction would be, okay, so if we're selling, let's say, nickel to China, and then we have these tensions, and then can we sell nickel to some other country? Right? I, I don't think nickel will be affected because it's a strategic good. <laughs> it's not. No, so it's not it's it's not something that uh, China would be encouraged to curtail. Maybe other goods, but not strategic goods, no, because they need that also for their industrial development. But but as a knee-jerk reaction, people here could say, oh, okay, so why don't we sell nickel to to another country? No, or why is that not possible right now? Why? Because the the grade, the quality of the nickel is low. Right? It's the Chinese plants over there that processes, uh, that, that, that actually can process you know, that low-grade type. So even if you say, okay, let's, let's sell it to Japan, they won't buy it because it's not high-grade. So regardless of China and Japan and the U.S., um, do we have a plan like Indonesia? Like Indonesia sort of closed the mines because we want to sort of develop, uh, you know, uh, put more value added in the processing and so that we could we, we wouldn't have to sell raw raw anymore. So it's like that. 
and these these issues are in many of our sectors and i hope i hope i hope because maybe i i kind of sound too strident all morning right too agitated but but my hope is that um we will not get used to we, we will not get used to this kind of a predicament in the philippines you know hoping for hoping for gains that we can get from agreements even if those agreements are there even if the doors are open right it will always be limited if it goes to that filter that so that the actualization would also be limited no while i agree with lucio no that infrastructure projects do take time you just have to look at other countries it doesn't take that long a time no <laughs> compared to ours no so in 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 indonesia's case well they don't have disputes no and they don't have the same disputes as we have with china but nonetheless um you could see the number of projects no number of completed projects and that it's staggering to see that they have more than 10 you know when it comes to their projects with china and okay sure even if they don't have uh, the same disputes as we have um it just makes you think right where ease of doing business it goes back to that right what what do we need to do so 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 what i'm saying is um while regardless of china the us japan uh, regardless of countries that we're partnering with right we need to clean up anyway right we need we need to make us stronger anyway except that since we have gotten used to it you know we had gotten used to it and it we made friends with our slowness so <laughs> we've accepted it we were assigned to it um i feel that uh the discussions on foreign relations should sort of make us worried a little right because once because when we start relating that should have a feedback loop in our minds like we, we want all these agreements but somehow why why is it just a trickling benefit unlike the benefits that we see in other countries so, so i like comparisons yun lang yun lang salamat thank you Thank you, Ma'am Tina, for saying that we need to be critically optimistic and yet we need to diversify and really plan, plan, and think, think, rethink. Ah, okay, I saw the hand of uh, Sir Lucio. Sir Lucio, go. Ma'am, I, I, I will just add on. So uh, right. in relation to convergence, so I think we, there's uh, this talk about, you know, whether the Philippines was left of uh, left of the train, you know, trying to, to join the Belt and Road Initiative. So again, the name to to me uh that doesn't have uh, a lot of importance you know so whether you call it you know long and winding road or fast and furious or you know country roads take me home uh i get it all boils down to whether this initiative had delivered projects elsewhere and uh what benefits can i gain whether this uh you know partnership can uh inject the needed reforms you know internally so i i think you know any initiative for that matter that would be of benefit to the country you know whether it's a belt and road initiative uh whether it's taking part in uh, negotiations for an indo-pacific economic framework or you know joining this partnership for global infrastructure investment build back better world initiative so you know there's alphabet soup uh, there's an alphabet soup of uh uh, infrastructure or connectivity initiatives uh, to to the extent that they would be of benefit to the country. I I think uh, there's merit to, to joining and you know be, being on, on having a seat you know in trying to form the rules of, of, of these initiatives taking part in in, in discussions. So now um, the in relation to to efforts to diversify or you know upgrade. Uh, our trade with with major partners. Well, uh, I I think uh, to 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 be fair, the, there are efforts. You know, for instance, just recently, Philippines uh, signed uh, its second bilateral free trade agreement with South Korea on the sidelines of the recent APEC summit in, in Jakarta. So it's our second bilateral FTA after JPEPA or our uh, Japanese uh, Japan uh, Philippines. Uh, bilateral FTA. So and then we're taking part in IPEF negotiations. And uh so I I think you know uh it, it, there are steps being taken. So for infrastructure for instance, you know the uh Korea would be funding the Negros uh, Gimaras Panay 
uh, inter-island bridge project. So I, I think this will be one of the flagship projects by this current administration under the Build Better More. So, uh, you know, uh, Japan is uh, already involved in our subway project in Metro Manila, our first subway. And also the North-South Commuter Railway to connect Calamba and Clark. So, you know, we're trying to uh, not put uh, all our eggs on a single basket or on a major basket. Uh, now, in relation to China, we're also trying to upgrade uh, the kind of trade we had. You know, we recognize, of course, the the, the, the valid uh, legitimate concerns raised by Dr. Clemente. Now, uh, again, in relation to agriculture, for instance, you know, durians is a more high value crop compared to bananas, you know. We're uh, a major exporter of, of bananas in the world. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to uh, expand the kind of uh, the, the menu of uh, fruits, uh, trying to grow to go to the more higher value uh, crops that command a higher price in the Chinese market. So whether it's avocados, uh, we're the only Asian country, I think, to date that exports has avocados to, to China. And then durians, you know, the previous government uh, uh, negotiated, you know, the entry of Philippine durians to, to, to China. This is the king of the fruits in China. It commands a very lucrative price in China. Now, in relation to minerals, uh, Martina correctly said, you know, we're one of the most mineralized countries in the world. And, you know, there is this global discussion about strategic uh, critical minerals or uh, critical materials. You know, uh, we had uh, a lot of reserves of nickel, uh, cobalt, you know, manganese. These are important in uh, producing electric vehicles, uh, batteries, the batteries for EVs. So the heart of the future of transportation um, materials that are necessary to produce them are in the country. Uh, but uh, to date, you know, unfortunately, we, we only have uh, two uh, processing plants, you know, one in Palawan and one in Surigao. We are trying to uh, get more investments, you know, both U.S. And, and China pledge that they will invest in developing cobalt or nickel processing facility in the Philippines. I remember during the visit of uh, Vice President Harris to, to the Philippines, uh, that was one of the uh, pledges that were made. Um, in the past government, there was also uh, a pledge, you know, uh, an investment uh, interest to develop a nickel processing facility, if I'm not mistaken, in Sambales. So I, I think we have to follow up on this, you know, um, because we're getting less value when we are exporting raw ores. In fact, you know, the Indonesia stopped exporting raw ores. Uh, they decided to smelt and process uh, these uh, minerals at home because they can get more. They are negotiating with Tesla. They are negotiating with BYD, you know, countries, the uh, uh, companies that produce electric vehicles to attract them to come uh, come in their country and produce the EV, uh, not only the batteries, but the electric vehicles themselves uh, in, in Indonesia. I think that's uh, an approach that we should be uh, looking at also going forward to, 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 to upgrade you know, our, our involvement in the value chain. That the higher we go in the value chain, the lesser susceptible we are uh, to any shocks, whether geopolitical shocks or you know, uh, really deliberate effort on the part of certain partners to, you know, pull some economic strings to us. So the higher we get to the value chain, the more um, uh, we can inoculate ourselves more. Thank you, Sir Pete Lowe, for sharing updates. So we could see the endless possibilities if only we shift our uh, point of view. So, uh, and to see that we need to be more strategic strategic in trying to see the economic value in the Philippines. So um okay I I have here maybe I'll just read one last question that um is for both like how has COVID-19 pandemic affected the overall dynamics of the Philippine China relations? Okay um any any of the two speakers who like to address the question here? Uh, Mampina, you, you, you can go first. Paul. Okay, Mampina. Uh, okay, I thought Lucia would go first. Okay. Um, how did the pandemic affect Philippine-China relations? Um, the overall dynamics. The overall dynamics. So I'll, I'll just I'll just stay on my lane, right? Okay. <laughs> I'll just focus on the economic dimension, right? Um, I, I guess because the Philippines had one of the sharpest uh, recessions 
um, because of the pandemic, we got a lot of, we, we were able to reflect no, on a lot of things. Um, it, it goes to show that uh, internally we're not, we, we have a long way to go in building resilience. Again, as I've said earlier, it's not to say that there's like zero being done. Of course not. Uh, it's just that when we benchmark with um, what the ideal picture should be and what's been done, then you see a very big disparity. You know? So uh, we, I'll, I'll start first with the domestic stuff and then I go to, to, towards our relation to China. Um, uh, what was critical was the fact that um, we lack inclusivity in many ways, in, in inclusive development in many ways, and that became vectors no, in the exacerbation of the pandemic effects. And what do I mean? So, for, ex for example, in, um, we are regionally or spatially uneven in terms of development. So if everything is concentrated in Manila, you just Manila just has to be hit and then we're all done. No? So uh, I think I was very bothered about that. We We always knew that. But it's different when you see when you experience it. No, you just have to freeze to 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 come up with, um, you know, Manila getting frozen, and it's like the whole country is done. No? so so that was one thing. But also, so so inequalities in so many ways. No, but the other thing is, um, also, um, the lack of inclusive development also, um, entailed no entailed vulnerabilities no, in terms of health. So you would see that those those who are who get less access, less access to things that matter in life. No, okay. um, jobs, healthcare, infra, no, housing. So all those um all those in in, in that predicament no, presented uh, the most vulnerabilities. No, because we, we we don't think about that unless uh, a, a huge disaster hits it, right? Just just thinking about nutrition itself, right? If you if you are if you have a employment if you're compromised in terms of jobs and you can't feed your family well, right? What else will you feed your family? But the things that you know that small amount your your wage your daily wage can can get you, no, and that that affects it it becomes a public health concern. Now you just need the pandemic to exploit that. Now, so I I I I would wish um a closer connection, a closer linkage that in terms of a security lens. Right? So it's not just we're not just we shouldn't just be concerned when it hits, but we, we should we should also already be concerned before disaster hits because that can, you know, any pandemic, any shock can exploit that. No. So okay. So how do we? How do I now go over to uh, the case with China? Okay. So um, uh, development study scholars uh, paid attention, paid a lot of attention to distance in the supply chains, right? So um, because of what we saw in the pandemic, you have if a if a major center in the supply chain gets hit, then it's going to affect everybody. So there was that. There was that notion that we also need to, um, we also need to encourage shorter distance. You know, like uh, having centers in the shorter distance. So it's not like okay, we it, it's it's great if if we trade here and then all the way to Europe into North America, back to Asia, and that is fine in in terms of just an efficiency argument. If that is efficient, but uh, we saw what happened, and so there's that rethinking. No, that uh, there's that rethinking in terms of what the supply chain should be. So the distance. So my question is, how much are we engaging with the rest of Asia? Because if you look at our pattern, it's uh, the U.S. is is North America is quite prominent, and then I didn't include the other countries, but you also have Europe, and that's fine. I'm not saying take all of those out. No, I'm just I'm just reflecting that um, we haven't really maximized even within ASEAN and even within Asia. No? So that's how that, that that that's what I'm thinking about. And in terms of uh our trade with China, any shock, whether it's a pandemic or some other shock, an environmental shock or a uh a war elsewhere in the world, right? How this affects um it goes back to our vulnerability profile. Right? 
our vulnerability profile uh, in terms of the products that we sell. No, so I would wish, um, I would wish, uh, a rethinking in that. I think from school, from the side of scholars, uh, we started thinking about that. No, what would, what, 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 what would happen if if something this catastrophic happened again? No, so yeah, it goes by. I'm consistent. You no, know, with what I've been saying earlier, while um, integration is is a good thing in terms of efficiency. Um, it could also be a bane, a bane when a shock happens and you're all in the same, you're all in the same place. No? So I think thinking about convergence slash integration would not be contradictory no? to trying to build resilience domestically also no? by, by, by doing other things. And I'm not just talking about diversifying markets, but also diversifying economic activities within because it's not right. It's not only we, we we've seen we've seen the mix of things that happened. Like Thailand was hit because of tourism. Tourism constitutes a very big uh, share, you no, know, in their GDP, right? Uh, Pacific Island nations as well. You no, know, it's like uh, they had also very very sharp reduction in output, you no, know, in GDP because they're highly dependent on tourism and no more flights, you no, know, during the pandemic. So so in our case, we're we're saying that oh, um. Since uh, the the Philippine tourism sector isn't as as robust as the other uh, tourism industries elsewhere in Southeast Asia, we were sort of shielded. No, but that's not that's not an excuse. I mean, if that if that's the kind of thinking that that we want to have, then basically then we shouldn't do anything, right? So if we don't do anything, you nothing much is affected. But but the resilience that we see in other countries is because. There's a diversified economic activities within the country, no, and also um, the spatial distribution no? of the economy. So that that that's something. No? You you get hit, but you bounce back. No, I mean, look at uh, it was Vietnam. No, within ASEAN and in in Asia, actually, it was Vietnam that bounced back, and then China too, no, later on. And you're you're wondering. Oh, okay. They have more exposure because just look at Vietnam Strait and Vietnam Strait in particular. Uh, when it comes to China, they have more exposure. So if you think about it, oh, if you're more exposed, then you're more susceptible. But that's the thing that we're saying, right? Resilience is not a one issue thing. It's um, it's a host of factors working together at the same time. No, because all economies were affected. No, it's just a mat. So, but all economies were affected. But it's just that the the mix of factors where you're strong at would determine the severity of how you will, you will be affected. So I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sir Lucio, do you want to add anything? Yeah, so uh, during the pandemic, of course, we see, uh, you know, despite differences of, of both countries, we have seen uh, China extended uh, assistance to the country uh, from uh, test kits to face masks to vaccines. Uh, also dispatching a medical team, you know, to share best practices, uh, you know, in, in the uh, early months, you know, as the Philippines tried to form its uh, response to this uh, global uh, health pandemic. So I, I think those efforts are uh, appreciated, I think. And uh, of course, you know, uh, a lot can be said about the, the timeliness of these interventions. And uh, of course, now that uh, the economy is trying to, global economy is trying to recover you know from the pandemic you know i i think you know uh philippines you know as well as its neighbors in southeast asia are, are looking at how to uh revive you know pick up from where they left off whether in terms of tourism you know Mantina mentioned about the importance of tourism for uh co some countries in the region like thailand uh now the chinese tourism which is the world's largest outbound tourist market in the world uh so going back to uh back to Thai tourism holiday destinations, you know, Pattaya, Phuket, and so on. So uh, other countries are also trying to, to catch up. You know, uh, tourism is one uh, important sector of, of the economy that they're trying to grow, uh, you know, in their efforts to diversify, you know, away from maybe two extractive industries or uh, also to complement infrastructure. So, so tourism is one, you know, I, I think also uh, picking up from where, uh, you left off in terms of infrastructure projects that may have been stalled, you know, uh, because of the pandemic, you know, delays. So uh, because of, you know, some necessary uh, technicians or engineers or experts 
unable to resume uh, return to their uh, project sites you know so now uh, timetables for these projects are being uh, uh, reconfigured you know so uh, again a lot of a lot of uh, economic activities are now being revived you know as uh, uh, countries try to race uh, race uh, compete with one another you know to bounce back from, from the pandemic Philippines is one so in in relation with China again we have to look at the sectors that uh, we want to develop you know whether it's agriculture uh, manufacturing uh, services uh, minerals processing tourism and see how partnership with China can fit in our broader international picture and uh, w what kind of uh, initiatives uh, should we look at and uh, should follow closely uh, to, to see whether it will jive dovetail with our interests and of course uh, try to, to grow other niches you know uh, I, I think these are all important uh, considerations for, for our country and thank you so much for our two distinguished speakers for answering those uh, complicated questions. <laughs> okay, at this point, that's the last question I have received. And um, okay, before we end today's session, may I just welcome everyone first to um, open their camera for a group virtual group photo. So um, okay, so can I just welcome everyone? Then I think um, yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so um. Uh, Wait, Sir uh, Father Ari, are you the one? Uh, okay. Patrick, Patrick will do it. Ah, uh, Patrick. Okay, yes. Patrick. Yes, please cue na lang, Patrick. Uh, um, I'm just waiting for others to open their camera. Okay, I think okay na po muna, no? So, Go ahead, again, smile po. One, two, three. Okay, no okay. Uh, so we end our session at this point and thank you once more for our speakers and thank you to everyone for joining today's session and hope to see you once more in the upcoming events of PAPS. Thank you guys and have a good day. Bye-bye. Good lunch. Bye-bye everyone.